I just want to welcome each and every one of you to this extremely important topic. And if there's only one topic that you could come to, this is the one that I would invite you to come to. It's that important. Rescue from above. I want to begin by sharing with you what took place on August 5, 2007. There in San Jose, um, in the country of Chile, uh, there was a, a major catastrophe that took place there in the gold and copper mine in Copiapo. Um, it was a mining accident um, where some 33 miners were trapped underground some 700 meters below the earth's surface as this horrible cave-in took place. Some, some 700 tons of estimated rock just descended upon this coal mine. The family members uh, got together and they began to pray. Uh, they desperately tried to get a rescue team to these 33 miners that were trapped below the earth's surface, but uh, they, hadn't, they hadn't started uh, and they hadn't spent much time uh, doing that when two days after the initial collapse, there was another collapse that further hampered the rescue effort. So the, they tried um, to find a way to, to connect with these miners to see whether they were dead or whether they were alive. No one knew. There was no contact with the miners. And so the people prayed. Day after day after day, they prayed. A day went past, three days, five days, a week went past, two weeks went past. No sign of the miners, whether they were dead or alive or whether they would ever be found. Then finally, after almost 17 days, there was a sign. There was a sign that they were alive. Uh, one of the drills that had gone deep down into the surface came up with this bit of paper attached to it that the president of Chile is holding up. Now, if there are any here that speak Spanish, you will understand what these words are. Estamos bien en el refugio los 33. Can anyone understand what that means? Nobody. Well, let me give you the English translation. <laughs> the English translation. We are all well in the shelter, the 33 of us. Wow, and the whole world erupted in celebration. They were alive. Fantastic. But one problem. How are we going to get these miners out of there? How are we going to get them out? They're buried 700 meters below the Earth's surface. And here were the first pictures that came out from these miners. As you can see, they haven't eaten much. In fact, their food supply ran out um, on the day that they managed to get contact that they were alive back to the rescue team above. 17 days, um, they had rationed two days of food to last them 17 days. And they had finally run out, and that was when uh, they made contact. Here they are, there's a little camera that's gone in there, and you can see they're a bit skinny, but they're alive. Dirty, smelly, I'm sure, tired, but they are alive. Well, how do we get them out? Um, the Chilean govern, government consulted um, many countries, um, including NASA. And finally, NASA came up with a capsule that was, entire, that was called Phoenix 2. Um, a one-man capsule, and through this capsule, they were hoping and praying that they would be able to somehow lift every single one of those 33 miners back to the surface. So here is this capsule, and it's about to make its way down with uh, a rescuer who was the guinea pig to see if it was all going to work. How would you like to have been the rescuer? <laughs> no, <laughs> especially if you're not very excited about a closed-in place. <laughs> so anyway, off we went down. There's the president. Um, he's wishing Manuel Gonzalez all the best. He's the first rescuer to, to go down the Phoenix 2. And shortly after, we have the first of the 33 miners brought to the surface. Here he is. Uh, Florenzo Avalos 31, 69 days after the collapse. Talk about a long shift. The longest shift in history, 69 days after the collapse, finally coming to the Earth's surface. And there he goes, he's hugged by the president, and there is his wife and his son looking on. You can just imagine uh, the emotion. And here is his wife, and um, looking into the face of her husband as she thought whether she would see him ever again. Here is the final miner, the foreman. He was the last, last one out. And um, 
Louis Urzua, 54, the last man rescued. And there was celebration right around the world. That was the front page headline of the Australian newspaper. Joy worldwide as Chilean miners are rescued. Generally speaking, the majority of mining accidents don't end with celebration, do they? They end with commiseration. But this time there was joy and there was happiness and the, the, the miners were rescued after the longest time spent below the Earth's surface after a mining accident. Here they are, all 33 miners. They became celebrities. Um, here is a meeting with them and the president and his wife at the presidential palace. They even met the Queen of England and had an opportunity to, to visit with her. As I thought about that story, I couldn't help of another story. You see, you and I find ourselves living in a planet where we are deep below the Earth's surface, so to speak, and we have only one option, we have only one hope, and that is to be rescued from above. You see, 2,000 years ago, God sent, not a capsule, but God sent an individual by the name of Jesus Christ to our planet to perform the greatest rescue effort that this world, that this universe has ever witnessed. You see, just like those 33 miners, you and I could not save ourselves. We were stuck deep in sin, the Bible says, and we needed to be rescued from above. And so this afternoon, we want to take a look at the ultimate rescue effort from above. But before we do that, and before we open up God's Word, and before we go on this most incredible journey that I believe you will never forget, we need to do what? We need to pray. We need to pray. So let's do that right now. Father in heaven, we ask and pray that as we open your word this afternoon, that you will open our hearts and our minds, that we will discover together what it took for heaven to perform this incredible rescue effort in order to give us a second chance at eternal life. So as we open your word, Father, we pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds, that we may be willing to receive what the Spirit has to say to each and every heart, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you're ready to go on an exciting journey? We're going to go on an adventure of a lifetime. I promise you, you can hold me to that. We want to begin by taking a look at what Jesus said in John 12, verse 32. Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said, If I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. What Jesus was simply saying at the closing stages of his ministry and his life here on earth, he was saying that as you look to me, as you look to me and my sacrifice on your behalf on the cross, that has the power to draw you to myself. If this does not draw you to myself, nothing else will. I want to put it to you this afternoon that what we're about to read and understand as best we can from God's word, if that does not draw us to Jesus, nothing else will. Nothing else that I can share or anyone else can share will draw you to Jesus if what we're about to look at this afternoon doesn't. Many of you have probably seen Mel Gibson's epic, The Passion of the Christ. How many of you have seen that? Okay, a number of you have seen that. Where Mel Gibson tries to portray through Hollywood's cameras um, what Jesus Christ went through from the Garden of Gethsemane all the way through to Golgotha. The main focus is obviously on the physical pain and the suffering that Jesus went through. I haven't seen the movie, but I know that many have seen it and it's pretty gory, it's pretty full on. So I've kind of refused to see it because it may be a little bit too much for me. And it's true, Jesus went through pain and suffering, physical pain and suffering that you and I will probably never be able to comprehend. But this afternoon, we want to go where Hollywood's cameras will never go. They cannot go. This afternoon, through God's word, we want to discover what Jesus actually went through in order to rescue us and provide us an opportunity for salvation. That's what we want to look at this afternoon. We're going to go to the Holy Word and we're going to bypass Hollywood. How does that sound? Sound like a plan? 
So we want to begin by going to the ancient city of Jerusalem. Uh, this, this city um, that, that has three major world religions that, that, are, that are all centered there and have, and have major space allotted to them, the, the Muslims, the, the, the Jews and the Christians, and they all descend, of course, from who? From Abraham. Father Abraham is the father of these three worldwide religions. And we want to go to the upper room there on that Thursday night where Jesus spent uh, that final evening with his disciples before the crucifixion. On that final evening, the Bible says Jesus prayed these words. In John chapter 17, verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you. The Father, the hour has come. Up until this point, Jesus had said, my hour has not yet come. My time is not yet. In fact, they wanted to kill Jesus on a number of occasions. And on one occasion, the Bible says they could not kill him because his hour had not yet come. But now Jesus said, my hour has come. My hour has come for for Father, for you to be glorified and for you to be glorified through me. Now, what does it mean to be glorified? The glory of God, the glory of Jesus is his character. Is his what? Is his character. So what Jesus was saying, the time has come, Father, for the whole world, for the whole universe to truly understand what my character is like, what your character is like. You see, God's character has been put through the dirt. It's been put through the mud. And when we look at the subject of hell, you will discover that that to be the case. His character has been put through the mud. Most people were brought up believing that God is, is waiting, waiting for you to do something wrong to do what? To hit you with a big heavenly stick. How many people believe that? Many people believe that. Many people believe what goes around comes around absolutely what goes around comes around and so if you reject God or if you're mean and nasty well then God's going to punish you you just watch out in fact we teach our children you know have you been good Jesus only likes little good kids no that's not true Jesus loves everybody the good kids the bad kids the in-between kids God loves everybody equally and there's nothing you can do to earn God's love, nothing you can do to have God love you any more and nothing you can do that will have God love you any less. That's the gospel. But let's press on. That The time had come for that promise to be fulfilled that God made to Adam and Eve some 4,000 years prior in the Garden of Eden after they had sinned, that God would supply a rescuer and that rescuer would be Jesus Christ himself. Well, before we go to the mount called Calvary or Golgotha, we want to need to go to the, the garden called Gethsemane. This is in the Latin there, in case you were wondering. It's in the Latin. Um, the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Gethsemane means oil press. Oil press. This is where the life of Christ, as we'll discover, was literally squeezed out of him. I had the opportunity in 2010 to go to the garden of Gethsemane. Um, there in Jerusalem. Um, this, these are olive trees from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They're still alive and well, these olive trees. I'm not sure if there was one from about 2,000 years ago. I think the, the tour guide might have said that some of these trees are almost that old, but I can't be for certain. But I remember praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as I prayed, I remembered the words that Jesus prayed when he was also in the Garden of Gethsemane two years ago. Notice these words that we find recorded by Matthew, the disciple of Christ, in Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now, how deeply distressed was Jesus as he prayed? How deep was his sorrow? Let's keep reading. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto what? Death. Stay here and watch with me. Now I used to think this was hyperbole that Matthew was using in order to emphasize the, the, the intensity of 
the struggle that Jesus was faced with. Jesus prayed. The Bible says he went a little further and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, what was in that cup that was placed before Jesus? What was in that cup was the sins of the entire human race. The sins of every single man, woman and child on the planet for the last 6,000 years. That cup was filled with our sins, not with Jesus' sin. He didn't have any sin, the Bible says. It was filled with your sins and my sins, with the sins of the whole world. And now the Father extended this cup and He said, Son, will you drink it? Will you drink it? And notice how Jesus prays. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And again, a second time, he went out and prayed saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And Matthew goes on and he says, So he left them, went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words, Father, let this cup pass away from my lips, but... If there is no plan B, then give me the strength to drink this cup. Jesus was praying, Father, is there a plan B? Is there a plan B? And the Father's, I'm sorry, son, there is no plan B. Either you will have to drink that cup or those that have sinned will have to drink the cup. Someone will have to drink the cup because the wages of sin is what? Death, the Bible says. They are the consequences of sin. Either you will drink it on their behalf or they will have to drink it themselves. And Jesus made the decision when our eternity was in the balance. That's where our eternity was, in the balance. Jesus made the decision that he would rather drink the cup, that he would rather be lost forever than you and I be lost forever. I can just imagine in my mind's eye what Jesus would have gone through, the, the temptations that he would have had to endure. Can you imagine the serpent, the devil himself, there in the garden, in, in the mind of Jesus Christ, placing in his mind thoughts such as, you came to die for this group of people and look at how they repay you. Your disciples. Let's start off with the disciples. One of them has betrayed you. Another one in a few short hours will deny ever knowing you. The rest of them, they're all going to flee and scatter when you need them most. They're all going to desert you. Don't go through with it. It's not worth it. You don't need to drink that cup. You can let it pass from your lips. It's their doing. They made the mess. Let them clean up the mess. It's true, we did make the mess. We made the mess. We're responsible for the mess. But you and I could not clean up our mess. We needed to be rescued from above. We needed someone else to take us out from this pit of suffering and sadness that we ourselves have caused. It was so intense. Matthew records, even unto death. Notice what Dr. Luke he was a physician and he makes this interesting note in his gospel. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, we read, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like what? Great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, I used to think once upon a time when I read these words that Luke here is once again using hyperbole, using exaggeration in order to make a point that Jesus that his sweat was so profuse because of the mental anguish he was experiencing that it was as if he was sweating blood until I did a little bit of research and I discovered the truth. You can actually sweat real blood. Did you know that? You can actually sweat real blood. Red, the red stuff. You can sweat it out. Notice this. I went to, um, <clears throat> did some research and I went to the health line and to this particular website, Healthline, and I, I, I put in the question regarding uh, this phenomena, and I discovered that sweating blood is called hematidrosis. Is sweating blood real? 
Okay, notice what we find here. Hematidrosis is a rare but real condition in which you sweat blood. Why? Not much is known about what causes hematidrosis, but it's thought to be a result of extreme stress or fear. Did Jesus experience extreme stress or fear in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed? Absolutely. Beyond what you and I can even begin to fathom. Here was Jesus. And he was faced with the reality that he would never, ever see his heavenly Father again. Now you're thinking, how is that, Danny? Where did you come up with that? We're going to get to that in a little bit. But the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, not talking about normal death. We're talking about eternal death, eternal separation. So Jesus here in his humanity, we must never forget, Jesus was both God and he was both human. Human and God at the same time, a unique individual. And his humanity experienced the fear of that ultimate and total separation from his heavenly father. When we get to the cross, we will discover that. Notice hematidrosis. I went to the free online medical dictionary and I discovered this definition. An extremely rare condition characterized by the sweating of blood, which is said to occur when a person is facing death or other highly stressful events. It has been seen in prisoners before execution and occurred during the London Blitz. Hematidrosis is attributed to rupture of the capillaries surrounding sweat glands with oozing of blood into the glands and out of the sweat ducts. It's a real phenomena that takes place when you are experiencing extreme anxiety, extreme stress is what Jesus experienced. And notice what the Bible goes on and says in Luke 22, verse 43. It says, Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. I am of the firm conviction that unless God sent an angel to encourage Jesus, Jesus never would have made it out of the Garden of Gethsemane alive. He would have literally bled to death there in the Garden of Gethsemane on that Thursday night. He never would have made it to Golgotha. But God would not allow the plan of salvation to be hidden in a garden away from the onlooking universe, from the onlooking world. Jesus made it very clear. And I, if I'm what? Lifted up, will draw all people to myself. So God sent his angel to strengthen Jesus, to encourage him to go through all the way to the cross. Jesus made a decision to drink that cup, that cup full of your sins and my sins. The Bible doesn't give too many details, but we know that the flogging that Jesus experienced, and those of you that have watched The Passion of the Christ, you will know full well. Uh, it was horrendous. 39 lashes and the whip, at the end of the whip, there was metal and bone and that would get embedded into the and I won't go through the details. You can, you can imagine what Jesus experienced there as he was beaten and whipped. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, 700 years before the event, Isaiah prophesied, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. The Bible tells us that they put a crown of thorns on Jesus' head. So that one day Jesus can put a crown of gold on your head and my head. Talk about an exchange. Talk about swapping places. Psalm 22 verse 16, David prophesied a thousand years before the crucifixion, they pierced my hands and my feet. In fact, this prediction was made 500 years before crucifixion was even invented. 500 years before it was even invented. They pierced my hands and my feet. The hands that brought sight to the blind. The hands that healed the lepers. The hand that restored life to the dead. The feet that walked endless kilometers to bring hope, to bring encouragement to countless thousands. Those hands and those feet were pierced 
with nails. Psalm 22, verse 18, we read, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, no artist in their right mind would picture Jesus the way most criminals were crucified back then. Today, the artists have a, a cloth around the private part, around the midsection, but not so back in the days when individuals were crucified. They were crucified literally stark naked. Why? In order to inflict the greatest possible shame and pain and, and, and mental anguish to the prisoners. In fact, if you're a Roman citizen, you couldn't be crucified. You couldn't be crucified as a Roman citizen. It was only for the worst of the worst that were not Roman citizens. Jesus was willing to possibly, we don't know for sure, but possibly to be completely shamed so that you and I can have that robe of righteousness that the Bible speaks of. To have a beautiful robe of righteousness that Jesus would place on us in order to cover our filthy rags, in order to cover our filthy shame. The Bible says in Matthew 27, verse 31, And when they had mocked him, they led him away to be crucified. Crucifixion was very common back then. During the time of Jesus, it was very common. It was just everyone knew what crucifixion was. So Matthew doesn't give us details. But today... We don't know what crucifixion is like. Well, sadly, they do practice crucifixion in some parts of the world. That's a, that's a horrendous thing to even think about. Crucifixion. It was a horrible way to die. Why? Because you could be on the cross anywhere from a day to two days to three days or more, hanging between heaven and earth in, in horrible anguish. It was a painful experience because you wouldn't necessarily die a quick death. You would just continue to live. There'd be the reflex of breathing and you wouldn't bleed to death either. And it was just a horrible way to spend those final moments of your life. Jesus was crucified on a cross. Today, the cross is a symbol of honor. In Christianity, we have crosses in churches, we have crosses in front of churches, on top of churches, we carry crosses around our necks, we have crosses hanging off our dashboards or our little mirrors in the car, we have crosses on the front of our Bibles. Uh, today, the cross is a symbol of honor. It represents Christianity. It's the main symbol of Christianity, but not so 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, the cross was not considered to be a symbol of honor, a symbol of pride. 2,000 years ago, the cross was a symbol of shame, horrible shame. To be placed on a cross was the worst possible experience that you could have that had eternal consequences. And we'll get to that now. The Apostle Paul, speaking of the crucifixion, this is what he had to say. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone having been hanged on a tree. Now here the Apostle Paul is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, there's a scripture that says, If you are hung on a tree, you are cursed by God forevermore. You see, the Jews believed that if you were killed, by a sword, if you were killed by a spear, if you were killed by an arrow, if you were killed by being stoned, there was still hope for you. There was still hope for you to be saved in the end. But the Jews believed, based on this scripture in the book of Deuteronomy, that if you were hung on a cross, a tree, there was no hope for you. You were eternally condemned you were doomed for all eternity. And so the Jews, the religious leaders, didn't ask for Jesus to be stoned. They could have stoned him. They didn't ask for him to be stoned. They asked for him to be what? Crucified. Why? Because they wanted a statement to be 
clear as day that here is one who claimed to be the Son of God and he deserves the worst of the worst. He deserves the curse of God. He deserves to be eternally separated from God. He deserves to be crucified. And notice what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he that is God made him that is Christ who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's phenomenal. Phenomenal. We could park ourselves right here and unpack what this scripture means. Jesus was willing to be sin in order that we might be righteousness. We are the ones that are full of sin. Jesus is the one that is full of righteousness. Can you see the swap? Willing that you and I should become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was tempted to come down from the cross and save himself. If you read the account, you'll discover that not once, not twice, three or four times, Jesus was tempted to come down from the cross by the soldiers, by the Jewish leaders, by the angry mob, even by one of those prisoners that was on the side of Jesus. This is what they taunted Jesus with. These words in Matthew 27 verse 42. He saved others himself he cannot save. They taunted Jesus with these words. He saved others himself he cannot save. In taunting Jesus, they had no idea, but they were actually preaching the everlasting gospel. They were preaching the good news of God and his love. Now, how is that, Danny? Let me explain. The truth is that Jesus could not save himself and save us at the same time. Someone had to be lost. And Jesus made a decision that if someone had to be lost, it would be him. It would be him. He would rather be lost for all eternity rather than you and I be lost for all eternity. How do I know that? We keep reading the story. Notice what the Bible says in Luke 23 verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, those, were there, those two words there, loud voice, in the original language, the Greek are mega Phone, megaphone. What words in English do we get from megaphone? Megaphone. This wasn't a whimper. This wasn't a whisper. This was a mighty shriek, a mighty call from Jesus Christ in a megaphone voice. He cried out these words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. What were those words that Jesus cried out before he committed his life into his Father's hands? Well, we're going to find them out in just a moment. Because the truth is, Jesus died after being on the cross for only six hours. And the question is why? I shared with you earlier that a person who was crucified um, could, could live, if you want to call it that, anywhere up to a day, two days, three days. In fact, the two criminals that were on either side of Jesus, you'll remember from the account, they were still alive after Jesus had died. And so they broke their legs. And that was actually a very merciful thing to do to someone who was crucified, break their legs. So that way they could not lift themselves up in order to breathe instinctively and they would suffocate and die. That was a merciful thing to do. But Jesus died after being on the cross for only six hours. You remember those words? Jesus cried out with a loud voice. What did Jesus cry out with a loud voice? Why did Jesus die after only six hours of being on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m.? Why? Have a look at the answer that we have here. Matthew 27 verse 45. Matthew tells us, Now from the sixth hour, that is from midday, until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, here are those words. My God, my God, why have you up? forsaken me? Jesus in his humanity experienced 
the curse of separation between God and himself. What all those who are lost at the end of time will experience, the Bible refers to as the second death. We're going to get to that next weekend. Jesus experienced that on the cross. He experienced that utter desolation when you have the Father turn his face away from you. Jesus here is quoting from the book of Psalm where it was predicted and prophesied that Jesus would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did the Father have to turn his face away from his Son? Why? Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your what? Iniquities. Another word for sin. That's what iniquity is, sin. But your sins, your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Sin is like cancer. Sin is like what? Cancer. Sin separates us from God. Just like cancer separates loved ones from one another. And so Jesus drank that cup. He drank that cup and he experienced the horror of that separation between him and his heavenly father. And that is why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Only by faith, only by what? Only by faith could Jesus look through the portals of the tomb and look to Sunday morning only by faith. He didn't experience that in his mind, in his heart, only by faith, he could say, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. I commit my spirit. Notice what we read in Psalm 69, verse 20. Reproach has what? Broken, Broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but found none. Now, who is this talking about? Is David talking about himself, where he says, Reproach has broken my heart? Or is David speaking of somebody else? Let's keep reading and it will become perfectly clear who David is speaking of. In verse 21, And for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Who's that speaking of? Jesus. Jesus was given vinegar to drink when he said, I thirst. What David here is saying is that the heart of Jesus was what? Broken. Broken. Now I ask myself, is it even possible to die of a broken heart? Maybe this is why Jesus died after being on the cross for only six hours. Maybe Jesus died of a broken heart. Is such a thing even possible? So guess what I did? Some research to try and find out the truth about that. I went to this website, the famous uh, John Hopkins um, Medicine um, unit there in the United States, one of the most famous hospitals in the world, John Hopkins. And um, this is what I found. Acute stress cardiomyopathy. Frequently asked questions about broken heart syndrome. What is stress cardiomyopathy? That's a real mouthful. Let me read it to you. Stress cardiomyopathy, also referred to as the broken heart syndrome, is a condition which intense emotional or physical stress can cause rapid and severe heart muscle weakness. This condition can occur following a variety of emotional stresses such as grief, for example, death of a loved one, fear, extreme anger and surprise. It can also occur following numerous physical stresses to the body such as stroke, seizure, difficulty breathing, such as a flare of asthma or emphysema or significant bleeding. I discovered that Jesus died of a broken heart. Literally died of a broken heart. And you can die of a broken heart. And that's what Jesus died from, a broken heart. Also, he died right on time. Three o'clock, the Bible says Jesus died on. What took place at three o'clock on that Friday afternoon? It was the Passover lamb that was sacrificed. That Passover lamb was Jesus Christ. The historian Josephus tells us what took place at 3 p.m. As the high priest had in his hand the knife ready to take the life of that innocent lamb, that Passover lamb at 3 o'clock, all of a sudden 
the curtain in the, in, in the temple ripped from top to bottom. You can read that in the scriptures. Ripped from top to bottom. And the high priest cried out, Ichabod, Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord has departed. Drop the knife, as Josephus points out, and the lamb ran away. Because the Lamb of God took the place of that Lamb that day. And that was the end of the sacrificial system. So when we read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We now know what it means when the Bible says God gave. God gave His Son. God completely gave everything when He gave His Son for you and for me. God emptied out heaven. Do you know heaven wouldn't be worth living in without Jesus? I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in going to heaven if Jesus is not there. Without Jesus, heaven is a place not worth being in for five minutes, let alone for all eternity. God was willing to give the best in order to save you and I. And if that doesn't draw us to Jesus, if that doesn't help us understand the character and the love of God, nothing else will. That is why countless thousands millions have been willing to suffer punishment being willing to suffer torture for the sake of christ being willing to be ripped apart by wild animals because of the one who loved them so much was willing to give up their life give up his life for them also they are willing to give up their life for him that's why first john chapter 3 verse 1 john the beloved disciple who was there at calvary he wrote these words behold what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the what? The children of God. He doesn't have words to describe the love of God. And all he can say is, behold, the manner of the love, that, the, 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 behold what manner of love that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. So how can I become a child of God? How can I become a child of God? Notice, what John writes in John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who do what? Who believe in his name. As many as receive him. As many as are willing to believe in his name. For those who believe, they will not perish, but have everlasting life. On that Friday afternoon, there was one who chose to become a child of God. There was one who chose to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord, as Saviour, as the Messiah. And we have the account as it's described by Luke in Luke chapter 23, verse 42. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And notice how Jesus responds. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus gave him the promise that very day that he would be with him in paradise. He would be with him in paradise. This afternoon, Jesus is giving you and I the same opportunity. The same opportunity to become a child of God. How do you become a child of God? It's not complicated. It's not complex. It's very simple. All you need to do is believe. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Accept the gift of eternal life that He freely gives to each and every person. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the wonderful gift of salvation. We want to thank you so much, Father, that Jesus was willing to be lost forever, that we might be saved forever. Father, we thank you that Jesus was willing to take on board our curse, my curse, that we may receive His righteousness, that He experienced the death that He didn't deserve, that I might, that we might have the life that we don't deserve. Oh, Father, we thank You for that awesome rescue from above that You performed by giving Your one and only Son, Jesus. We thank You and praise You and forever and ever we will give you all the honor and all the glory and all the thanks for it belongs to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.